uh, in November 2003 uh, to speak more on the Spectre gunships. Uh, an AC-130 gunship attacked an apartment building, uh, a complex of five buildings. There are photographs of that. Uh, and if somebody could project uh, my photographs, the AC-130 photographs, uh, there's just maps and such, um, satellite photographs, so you can get an idea. Uh, most of our post was safe from enemy direct fire attack. Direct fire is small arms, rifles, and things like that. Uh, indirect fire would be mortars and rockets, which they could lob over a wall. But direct fire, we had a pretty good perimeter as far as that, except for this one spot. And there was a, uh, a length of road that was perhaps a quarter mile distant, uh, maybe about a mile away from our barracks. And on occasion, uh, uh, people would shoot from this building, and it was, uh, you know, it was supposed that there was spotters for mortars that were calling in mortar fire on our post in this building. Um, so there were a handful of active insurgents who were trying to kill Americans uh, out of these apartment buildings. Uh, but what is really interesting about the apartment buildings is they, they were regular apartment buildings occupied by families. Uh, and we knew this. Every time you drove by, uh, you know, people would be out on the balconies getting fresh air. There was laundry hanging off of every balcony. Uh, there was constantly people all over. And this place was a heavily populated, uh, you know, so they were all in there squatting or something. Uh, Nobody really cared, you know. Yeah, sure, you know, they shot at us a few times. They spotted mortars from there. You know, nobody ever got killed from this stuff. We didn't really care about it. We just were careful around that area. Uh, but one day, uh, as was told, this is, you know, the official story that was told to us by our chain of command was that the squadron commander, who was a lieutenant colonel, had rode by there in his personal Humvee and that they'd made the mistake of shooting at him. And, uh, and either that night or the next night, uh, they, they sort of went around and told everybody, that uh, at about 10 o'clock that night, they were going to put on a show for us. Uh, so this AC-130, which Hart described pretty well, shows up and uh, doesn't just strafe or shoot a few rounds here and there. Uh, it comes up and launches a, a, a sustained attack on these buildings. It circled numerous times, expended quite a bit of ammunition. Um, Steve, do you have the quotes of what the lieutenant colonel said? Before you move on, I want to make sure that we are advancing the photos along with the testimony. So, Jeff, if you could uh, get up the images that uh, that uh, Cliff and Steve uh, have up for us, because there are images of the satellite imagery. So I just want to um, find out if we have that, and then uh, we can have them describe those images if they're available. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Lieutenant Colonel Williams, who was the colonel whose personal Humvee was purportedly shot at, um, did an interview with CBS that, that, that afternoon before it happened. Um, and he is quoted as saying, if you are trying to send a message by firing and harboring yourself inside of an area like this, we want to send the message right back that you can be reached. We will find you and surgically remove you. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but um, Spectre gunships are, are used. They're not a precision weapon. There's no precision to it, as there is with surgery. So to have him compare that is a little odd. Um, but that's not the route he took. Um, he didn't go into too much detail, apparently, of how it was going to be done. Um, but I have video evidence that was unfortunately too long uh, to bring, uh, but I do have video evidence of the, of the airstrike itself. Um, and the most disturbing part, because um, you can't see a whole lot from where we stand, it's about a couple of kilometers outside the gate, um, is that the parties on the rooftops, our roofs were set up in a semicircle around this, this post and building after building, and they were Everyone was told to grab their chairs and popcorn and jerky and go on top and watch this, watch this thing go down. Um, I was there. I, I, I probably hooped and hollered as well. Um, there were pe people quoted on the video um, saying, higher up NCO saying, can you hear Haji die? We don't have zone five anymore because they just blew the out of it, et cetera. Um, and lots of cheering, lots of jeers, and good times for the, uh, for, the, for the show that they had they put on for us that night. And at the time, you don't really take in, you know, you know there's civilians there, but 
that's what we're supposed to do. So I uh, never got a true body count out of it. Uh, we never went to inspect the rubble afterwards. Uh, but I can tell you that it happened. Uh, and he can tell you that it happened. He was on a separate building, a different vantage point, watching the same show. So I don't think I have much more with that. And you, you, you gentlemen have a, a video of the house raid, is that Yeah, correct? actually I wanted to get to that. It's going to be at the very end. Okay, That's at the right. end. We're That's going to do just a couple more things briefly here. Okay, you got uh, it. I mean, to wrap up the C-130 attack part, uh, you know, like I said before, I don't recall exactly how long it circled. These planes circle until they pretty much expend ammunition. Uh, but the main weapon it used in this raid was the 40 millimeter uh, cannon, which is an automatic loading cannon that can fire maybe, I don't know, around every every half second or so. And it's a 40 millimeter round, which is like a hand grenade basically exploding. Uh, and it fired, I don't know, maybe a hundred of these things. It was so many. Um, but I do recall it was the most destructive and devastating thing that I have ever witnessed before or since. And I would like to emphasize that this building, besides having a handful of people with, uh, with rifles who didn't really know how to shoot them and a handful of people who spotted for mortar tubes who didn't really know how to spot uh, and are very inaccurate, besides them, uh, it, was com it was packed full of innocent families. And it was in no way a legitimate military target. If you wanted to get rid of the guys in there who were actually doing something, there's different ways to do it. Uh, we worked with the 82nd Airborne who had plenty of snipers. We could have, you know, one sniper over the course of a week uh, could have solved the problem with zero damage to civilian person or property. One more thing to add. Um, another thing to add, um, the, another, one of their main objectives was to rid the, uh, the, rid the, the camp uh, of the mortar fire that we got almost daily. Um, and we were mortared from the day that we got there until the day we left including the days after this target was destroyed. So um, he may have done some surgery or what have you, but um, I can assure you that I still have plenty of issues um, having when, when I, uh, with loud noises and et cetera by mortars landing daily on and around my, my post. And um, I, I just don't see any justification for it all, I guess. Two more things about me before I turn the rest of my time over to Steve. Um, on 21st of January 2004, I have exact dates because I wrote about all this in my journal. Uh, a civilian was run over and left for dead by one of our Humvees. Uh, I'll be brief about this. It was a, we had been on a long night mission. We'd been out all night. We were tired. We wanted to go home and, and hit the rack. And uh, there'd been a lot of shooting that night. It had been a real bad night and we just wanted it to be over. We wanted to go home. Um, and so these guys ahead of us were coming in the gate, and apparently they, they ran somebody over. Uh, because we were so tired and we were so sick of it all and we just wanted to go home and hit the hay, they didn't say anything. Uh, the staff sergeant, I mean, I, I know the guys in the Humvee, I know the driver, he's one of my best friends, and uh, the, the staff sergeant in command of the patrol was also a very close friend of mine. He's since been killed over there. Um, but the staff sergeant ordered the driver to continue driving, and then he also ordered everyone else on the patrol not to say anything about it. Not because they were afraid of getting in trouble for killing somebody, but because he didn't want to have to wait around and fill out a report, or he didn't want to have to be inconvenienced. They just wanted to go home and go to sleep. And again, as I said in my opening statement, these are not bad people, these are not criminals, these are not monsters, these are people like any of us, but they're put in a, a horrible situation and they respond horribly. And uh, when you're around that much death, uh, running over some guy, who was standing in the road uh, is not a big deal. What's a big deal is getting stuck and being separated from your cot for another two or three hours having to talk about it. So they didn't say anything. Um, and, uh, you know, we rolled up on them, and, and then, you know, we, we were kind of the, the idiots who stopped and called it up, and we got stuck out there for three hours. And after that, uh, you know, that never happened again. We made sure that if, if we ever saw anybody dead or anything like that, we just kept going because uh, it wasn't worth the trouble. Uh, 